Hey everybody, uh, it's great to be with you again to share uh, the Word of God. Uh, just in case any of you don't know me, my name is Adam uh, and I'm a missionary in South Africa based in Johannesburg. And, and yeah, it's just really good for me to be able to share into this amazing Mark series this morning. Uh, I'm loving the, the topic who is Jesus? I'm, I'm really enjoying looking at the Gospel of Mark with, with this in mind. And, and today I'm going to be looking at um, Mark 5 verses 21 through to 43. So you can just turn there now. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed uh, just looking at the clever way that Mark records um, Jesus, uh, how he reveals actually the answer to our question, who is Jesus? And he does it um, with, with Jesus not even having to declare, in a sense, with words, the truth of who he is. Instead, we see through Jesus's life and ministry, the answer to this question being revealed. And I would say that the answer is being revealed in an even more powerful way than simply by Jesus just declaring it with words. If you've missed it or you haven't worked it out yet, the answer to who is Jesus is that he is the Messiah. He is God. Amen. Um, and if we look back to some of the preachers that we've already listened to uh, in, the, in this book of Mark, Daniel kicked us off with the series. Uh, he helped us to see that Jesus was God. Uh, and this was revealed to us by us seeing and understanding that Jesus was the fulfillment of the prophecy spoken back in Isaiah. Uh, the long-awaited promise of God was actually Jesus. Uh, in Drew's preach, he revealed the truth that Jesus is God by showing us that Jesus uh, has authority over the spiritual world. Drew shared that story that Jesus told of the strong man which helped us to understand that Jesus is the strong man. And in order uh, to have authority and strength over evil spirits, you can't be evil, but you have to be God. Amen. And then in John's preach, he revealed Jesus to be God by the fact that Jesus has authority over creation. And Jesus commanded the sea and he commanded the wind to calm down, to be still. And creation obeyed because it had to. It had to because Jesus is God. And when God says something, you do it. Amen. So now as we continue into this Gospel of Mark, uh, I encourage you to look out for not just the words of Jesus, but also for the works of Jesus. So let me read Mark 5 verses 21 to 43. It says, And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd followed, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather she grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Verse 30. And, and Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. 
But the woman, knowing what had happened in her, came in fear and trembling, and she fell down uh, before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble this teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he entered, he said to them, why are you making commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but she's sleeping. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talithia Kumai, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. And Lord, we pray that as as I speak and as I just reveal your truth through your scripture, Lord, the Holy Spirit, you will just do something in our lives this morning, that you will do something new, that you do something fresh. I pray, Lord, that our eyes would be opened, our minds, our hearts would be open, that we would encounter you this morning, that you would do something mighty that would produce great fruit uh, in, in, our, in our lives, uh, in our ministries, in our community, Lord, we just say, have your way with us this morning. In your precious name, amen. Amen. So this morning, I'm going to reread, free, uh, reread through these events. and I'm going to highlight a few teaching moments, as well as some of the moments that I felt God saying I should focus in on. Uh, and, and through this, we will focus on two main aspects um, that, that I just feel uh, the two main aspects that once again confirm that Jesus is God. Did you get that? So let's go again from verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and he implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter, she's at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. So firstly, One of the things that Mark draws our attention to is the popularity of Jesus. Jesus doesn't have a Facebook account where he tells everyone where he's going to be in the next few hours. In fact, he isn't making it easy for people to follow him. He's crossing back and forth over the sea and he's moving fast. But still, every time he kind of puts his feet on land, people quickly gather around him. We read this in verse 21, that as soon as he gets to the other side, he's met by a great crowd. And to be honest, Jesus' popularity, it makes sense. Remember what has been happening around Jesus lately. John John pointed out that it wasn't only Jesus' boat in the storm, but there would have been many other boats with fishermen and people maybe trying to follow Jesus. And in that storm, there would have been many people fearing for their lives in the storm, fearing uh, that this was the end. But then all of a sudden, in this crazy storm that came from nowhere, it all suddenly stops in an instant. And when they start to ask, what happened? Did you hear, you know, confused to why this storm stopped? They learn that Jesus commanded the winds and the seas to be still and they obeyed him. Or maybe uh, the crowd had heard the powerful testimony that happened just after that, 
about the, the once possessed man. He had many evil spirits that were, that were in him. We read that the man couldn't be chained because he was too strong for chains. The man ran kind of naked around uh, and he lived in the tombs. Um, maybe they heard this man's uh, testimony because now he was healed and he was sharing about how Jesus had commanded the evil spirits and they had left him. For whatever reason, we read that Jesus has become pretty popular. Then we read in verse 22 about this really interesting moment. A ruler of the synagogue, Jairus by name, falls at the feet of Jesus and he's begging Jesus to come and lay his hand on the daughter so that she might live. The reason that I say this is interesting is that at this time, it's, it's still fairly early in Jesus' ministry. So what had this Jewish leader heard about Jesus that made him have a faith or, or a belief that Jesus would be able to heal his daughter and that he would be willing to heal her? It's, it's interesting because this man was a Jewish leader and most other Jewish leaders were not falling humbly at the feet of Jesus. Most of the Jewish leaders so far in the Gospel of Mark are recorded as not being that impressed with Jesus. They, they didn't like that he healed people, especially on the Sabbath, the day of rest. Many other Jewish leaders uh, had the opposite to faith. In fact, they, they questioned Jesus and the power that he was working in. When Jesus forgave sins, which only God could do, they didn't think, okay, he must be God, but rather they said he's blaspheming, something um, that should be punished by death. But here in our focus passage, we have a Jewish leader, a respected leader in the community, falling humbly at the feet of Jesus, begging him to come and save his daughter. In fact, commentaries on this scripture point to the fact that the girl was, was pretty much dead already. The family would have been told those horrifying words. There's nothing else we can do. It's too late. She's gone. But despite all of this, despite the hopelessness of this physical situation, this man has a faith that if Jesus can just touch her, then he is confident she will live. Something I was wondering at this point in the story was, who does this man think Jesus is? That's the question we're asking. Who is Jesus? Does he think Jesus, Jesus is maybe a, a Jewish prophet? Does he think he's a powerful Jewish rabbi? Does he not even care who he is? Or maybe, just maybe, from what he has heard, maybe he thinks Jesus is the promised Messiah. Well, we don't know uh, who he thought Jesus was, but one thing we do know from this account is that he had a faith. He had faith that Jesus could heal. He had faith that Jesus had some type of authority or power that was going to work. We read on in verse 24 onwards. And a great crowd followed him and, and thronged around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather she grew worse. She had heard the, res the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and just touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. Here again, it's just a really interesting moment. The, the great crowd that we mentioned is, is still following Jesus. Maybe they knew about the, 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 the daughter's sickness. Uh, they, they knew the state of her health. And now they are pumped to follow Jesus to see for themselves maybe a miracle. It's gotten so intense that we read that they were thronged around him, meaning that this was a, a packed crowd, something that we haven't really experienced in a long time. It would have been uh, uh, as intimate as the London Underground on a busy day where everyone is rubbing up against each other, whether you like it or not. 
it's one of those moments where you have no choice but to read the paper of the person standing next to you. And in this mix of people, there's this woman who has heard about Jesus. What exactly she has heard, we don't know. Had she heard that he was the Messiah? Had she heard he was a powerful healer? We don't know. But what we do know is that this poor woman has had an illness for over 12 years now. And as a result, her whole life has been turned upside down. These 12 years have led her to poverty. All her money has come to an end in pursuit of trying to be well. And in the process, she suffered at the hands of physicians. I can only dread the thought of what uh, people have done to her with the promises of making her well. Desperate people um, do end up in horrible places with the hope of being healed, with the hope of their suffering coming to an end. On top of the physical suffering, uh, this sickness would have brought about emotional and mental pain because culturally, when you had a blood issue as a woman, everything that you touched and sat on was considered unclean. And people would have also become unclean if they touched her or the things that she touched. So people would have avoided touching her. They would have avoided contact. She might as well have been a leper. And as we read that in the pursuit of, uh, of healing, uh, still her illness becomes worse. One commentary on this moment explains it like this. Among religious Jews, it was and still is considered immodest and inappropriate to touch a man, even one's husband, in public. But even worse, this woman was uh, ritually unclean and could spread her impurity to any person she touched. She could have faced serious consequences for such a bold action. But this woman was bold. She was brave. She was determined. And we read in verse 27 that she pushed her way through the horde of people, making everyone that she touched unclean just so that she could touch Jesus' garment. She had a, a faith that drove her to Jesus. I'm sure she had many voices in her head telling her to stay away, to stay back and to do what was culturally right, to, to keep away from everyone and to not entertain the hope of healing again. But she had such faith, she was prepared to risk all to get to Jesus. And we read on in verse 29. And immediately the flow of blood, it dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And this, uh, and his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. This portion of scripture is where we actually find our first focus point on who is Jesus. And that is that Jesus is the authority over sickness. Jesus is the authority over sickness. This woman uh, had faith. Um, she, was, she was desperate. She was brave. And that led this woman to pursue Jesus. And in verse 29, we hear that immediately after touching the edge of his garment, her sickness was healed. If this were a film about the woman's life, it would be an epic moment in the movie. It's that moment with dramatic music as she risks all going through everybody just uh, to touch him, knowing, the, knowing what could happen to her, knowing the, the charges that she might face. 
But as she touches his garment and knows that she's been healed, her face changes from one of anguish to one of, of just um, amazement and, and, and joy because for the first time in 12 years, she is standing there clean, healed. And we read on, don't we, in verse 30, that Jesus is aware that power has gone out from him. And this is a, a really important moment to pause and reflect. This woman has done everything she can do. But what's very clear here is that the healing takes place because of the power that goes out from Jesus. Not from his garment, not from the woman, but the power that heals comes from Jesus. It's Jesus' power, it's Jesus' authority that heals this woman's sickness. We read on in verse 30 that Jesus is asking, who touched my garment? The, the disciples think this is hilarious. Can you imagine on that busy day on the London Underground when everyone is squeezed up against each other and someone yells out, who touched my coat? But Jesus knows that it's not just anyone that has touched him, but someone with purpose and faith has touched him. And as a result, power has gone out of him. Verse 33, Jesus tells us the woman owns up and she's scared. She comes falling at his feet in complete fear. She's trembling. And her fear makes sense when you think back to what we said about the potential consequences to her bold move. Now uh, that this woman, uh, now what this moment, sorry, also tells us about this woman is this. She doesn't fully understand who Jesus is. And to be fair to her, that makes sense. Unlike us, she doesn't have the Bible to tell her everything about Jesus. She's only heard bite-sized accounts of who Jesus is and what he can do. We have every account of Jesus at our fingertips. But it's clear she doesn't fully understand who Jesus is. Because if she did know him fully, then she wouldn't have been so scared to come before him. We know that Jesus is kind, he's loving, caring, gracious, gentle and compassionate. But this woman doesn't know that about Jesus. But from what she does know, it's enough to give her the faith that he can heal her. And now her faith has been proven right because she's healed. She's clean. Then in verse 33, we read she tells Jesus everything, which also means she's telling everyone around her what's just happened, which must have been Scary and maybe even shameful, but this woman's bold. Uh, as she tells Jesus everything, she's maybe wondering if he's going to treat her how other religious leaders have treated women in the past. She has no idea of what's about to happen next. Jesus says to her in verse 40, 34, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And I just imagine her instantly feeling secure and safe as Jesus says that word daughter. I love how Jesus doesn't waste uh, time in this moment to make her feel safe and secure. The first word that he says brings security and comfort. Daughter. Then he continues, your faith has made you well, go in peace. And I imagine as he says those words, go in peace, the very peace of God that surpasses all understanding just comes over her. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the authority over sickness. Amen? Just before we move on, I wanna take a moment here to share maybe what I would explain as a prophetic moment. When I was reading this account, I believe the Holy Spirit just nudged me to see something. We read that there was a massive crowd that were all packed together, trying to be as close to Jesus as possible. Many would have been close enough to touch him. Uh, many would have actually touched him. Uh, all of the people there could have said, 
They were there in the presence of Jesus. But only the woman connected with Jesus. Only the woman came into his presence with the expectancy and faith of receiving from Jesus. And what we learn from Jesus' own words in verse 34 is that what separated her from the rest of the crowd was faith. One commentator says it like this. This incident shows the mysterious connection between the spiritual and the physical. The miraculous virtue or power that went forth from the Saviour was spiritual in its source and in the conditions on which it was imparted, but it was physical in its operation. And that which brought the two together was faith. Multitudes thronged the Saviour, but only one of the crowd touched him. And friends, I just felt to encourage us this morning to, to stir our faith by reminding us that we can at times position ourselves in the right places. We can physically do the right things, position ourselves physically in the church building or in front of a device to watch church online. We can be in prayer meetings, etc., Bible studies, and God can be there. They can be spiritual moments as well. But what brings the physical and the spiritual together is faith. Faith that God will heal. Faith that God will minister to me. Faith that God will speak his word of truth to me. Faith that God will use me to love and care and stir faith in those around me. Faith that God's will will be done in this moment. Let us be careful not to get in a rut of doing the physical and being in the spiritual places, but not actioning our faith in those moments. We don't want to be like the crowd that was so close to Jesus but got nothing. We want to be like the woman who combined the physical and the spiritual by actioning her faith so that we encounter the power and the presence of God. Amen? And this leads us to the second focus I want to get from these scriptures. And that is that Jesus is the authority over death. Verse 35. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Now, like I said earlier, some hint to the fact that this news is not new news. In fact, depending on how you read it, it could sound like these people are confused even as to why on earth this man went to get Jesus. Your daughter is dead. Why are you troubling the teacher? Whether that's the case or not, here comes either devastating news or a confirmation of what the man knew in his heart, that his little girl is dead. The people bringing the news have completely given up on any hope of this girl living. They say, don't trouble the teacher anymore. They are certain she's gone. Verse 36. But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. This is a precious moment. No one in the household of the Jewish leader had the faith in Jesus to heal or save this girl from death, only the man. I think if others had had his faith, they would have also run with him and they would have also been falling at the feet of Jesus. But this man was alone. He is the only one who has faith. And as I prepared this, I just felt to say to someone listening today, that Jesus sees you persevering in your faith. Even though maybe those around you seem to have given up and you feel like you're running to Jesus on your own, if that's you, I feel Jesus wants to encourage you with the very words that he says to the Jewish leader. Do not fear, only believe. Jesus sees that fear has started to creep into this man's confident, hopeful faith. But faith is, is definitely still there. And Jesus says to him, don't fear, only believe. Have faith. We read on in verse 37. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James 
and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? This child's not dead, she's sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. The fact that there was already a mourning party gathered uh, suggests to me that the girl was dead and had been dead for a while, according to them. To hear Jesus say, she isn't dead, is so outrageous in their eyes that they can only laugh at what they perceive to be stupidity. In this moment, we also see some answers to who Jesus is. He is understanding. He's thoughtful. He's caring. He gets rid of the crowds. He gets rid of the morning party and just takes the closest people to him and to the girl into the room. Verse 41. Taking her by the hand, he says to her, Talithia kumai, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. Here we have another physical and spiritual moment being connected by faith. Jesus told the man, believe, meaning have faith. But it's also important to see and and know that it's Jesus who takes the girl by the hand. It's, It's Jesus who tells her to arise, And it's at his voice, due to his authority, that she immediately wakes and begins to walk around. The girl carries on being a little girl, doing the things that girls do. The woman carries on being a daughter, living life. And they both can do that because of the authority of Jesus, because he is the authority over sickness, and he is the authority over death. Amen? Verse 43. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this, and told them to give her something to eat. I won't say much here, but the more and more I read these moments of Jesus saying, don't say anything, which he says a few times, I believe he says this, Actually, because most of the people still at these points don't really know or understand who Jesus really is. They don't have a a clear understanding of who Jesus is. But this is also really encouraging for us because these two main characters in our story experience the coming together of the spiritual and the physical even when their faith was not perfect. The man thought that Jesus needed to lay his hand on his daughter. Unlike the centurion soldier who we read about, who says to Jesus, Hey, you don't have to come. Just say the word and I know that my servant will be healed. Jesus said his faith was amazing. This man doesn't have a great faith like this. And the woman thought, if I can just touch his garment, thinking that there was maybe something mystical uh, or, or there was a spiritual spirit, special virtue about the clothing that he wore. They didn't fully understand who Jesus was, but they did have faith that he could heal. And Jesus actually commends their imperfect faith. To the woman, he said, hey, your faith has made you well. And to the man, he said, just believe, only believe. Let us be careful of not moving in faith because we're not sure if our faith is good enough. These two people had imperfect faith, but when they actioned their faith, God moved. Amen. In closing, the whole point of Jesus revealing to the people back then and to us today that he has the authority over sickness and death was to bring about a response. He wanted the people then and he wants us today to believe that he is God. And and we need to respond accordingly to that. Friends, after hearing this today, you can either respond how Christ would desire you to respond or you don't. 
The response I hope you have to this word, if you're a follower of Jesus already, is that your faith is encouraged. Uh, that you're encouraged to remember that Jesus is the authority over sickness and over death. And I hope that this encourages you personally from any fear that maybe you have over death and that it might encourage your faith to be praying more and more for people to be healed. And if you're listening to this word today and you're not a follower of Jesus, I've been praying for you that you would respond just like the woman and the man in our scripture today. That upon hearing about Jesus, that you would have faith. Faith that he is able to heal, but even more important than that, that you would have a faith that Jesus is God. And if that has happened to you, then I want to encourage you to to use this time now to speak to God, uh, to have a conversation with him, ask him to keep revealing more and more of himself to you, that you might know uh, more and more who he is. I encourage you also just to tell someone at church or a Christian friend uh, that you've come to faith in Jesus as God. And I encourage you to ask them to pray with you and to journey with you as you journey uh, with Jesus. Uh, But please, friends, I hope you don't leave this moment with doubt. I hope you don't leave still asking, does Jesus really have authority over sickness and death? Was he really God? But if that is you, I want to encourage you not to give up seeking for truth and seeking for understanding. The word of God encourages us to keep seeking and asking questions because when we do, we will find the truth. Amen. I just want to pray for us right now. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the beautiful truth that we see through this scripture today, through this story of, of your life, how your, how your actions revealed that you are God, how your actions revealed that you are the authority over sickness, that you are the authority over death. Lord, we pray, Lord, that this truth that we have heard today would produce uh, good in us, that it would encourage our faith, that it would stir us uh, to, to be confident, to pray for the sick, to lay hands on the sick, to anoint people with oil, to, to see those uh, encounter you. Help us, Lord, to, to, to make sure that we are actioning our faith every day, that we're not just positioning ourselves in the physical and in the, and in the spiritual, but we're, we're joining the two by, by activating our faith and we will see the spiritual in the physical. Lord, we want to see more of you in our lives. And so, Lord, we, we thank you for this time and we commit this word uh, to you. Let it, let it, let it not uh, depart from us, but let it, let it minister to us and let it, let it do that that you uh, wanted it to achieve. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys, for letting me share with you today. Hope to see you all very soon. Goodbye. Amen. Wow. There's a lot in there. Let's just use this time to respond to God.